welcome to another edition of the In Search SEO podcast, where we paint the town red with search marketing insights. This week we have the man, the legend, Stefan Spencer, to offer you truly holistic, if not downright spiritual insights at doing SEO at scale and doing it successfully. The role of team building when doing SEO at scale, how to find the right team for the right SEO tasks, and the actions you can take to develop your SEO team the right way. Plus, subdomain leasing, are you freaking kidding me? I am your host, Morty Oberstein, and I am, of course, joined by the fiery and the never cantankerous Sapir Carabello. Hello, Morty. Is that going to be a thing from now on? <laughs> yes, definitely. Oh, okay, I'm just so going to remind you of, of your uh, friend's mom every okay. podcast now. So in case you didn't join us last week, I was telling a story where a, um, a friend of mine in school, in sixth grade <laughs> math class, his mom, his mom worked at the school. And she would burst into the room pretty much every day. And she would just, his name was Joel. And she would just sort of scream out, hello, Joel. <laughs> and of course, it was horribly embarrassing for that man, for that child. And somehow that came up last week on the podcast. And now Sapir is trolling me with it. Right. All right. I get it. Great. Thank Get's you. Get used to it. Done. Okay. Used to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How, how are you? How have you been? How was I'm your good, week? I'm good. Just, it's, it's okay. It's, yeah? yeah? It's okay? Yeah. Yeah. How was yeah. yours? That was terrible. Why? No, it was great. The kids are back in school and NFL football is back. Are you kidding me? I don't know what to do with myself because I've been really into baseball this season because the Yankees are doing amazingly well. We don't care. I'm going to finish this. <laughs> and now the NFL season is here and the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to reign supreme, obviously. And I don't know how to handle all the sports at one time. I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed, to be honest with you. Are you done? Yeah. No one cares. Thank Every, you. All the NFL people are like, yeah, football is back. And all the people in the UK are like, football, that's soccer. Until I say, it's not a sport unless you lose brain cells. <laughs> Great philosophy. Yes, that's my philosophy on sports. Boxing, <laughs> hockey, and football. Uh, okay. Do not forget, we put out a new episode of the In Search SEO podcast each and every Tuesday. You can find it on the Rain Ranger blog. You can find it on Stitcher. You can find it on Spotify. You can find it on SoundCloud. And, of course, you may subscribe on iTunes. Oh, big news. Mm -hmm. Big, big, big news. We, as in Rank Ranger, have released our schema markup generator tool. This is a free, as in you don't need to pay for it. This is a free tool that lets you generate, test, and validate the code for person, how-to, and uh, FAQ, and article markup. That's pretty So you great. can generate your schema right there, baby. Amazing. Right there. Woohoo! Woohoo! Oh, did I mention it's free? Yes. Yes, I Woo did. Woohoo! Okay, so. <laughs> um, head over to the Rank Ranger website, look under the resource tab at the top of the Rank Ranger homepage, and you will see the schema markup generator tool listed there. Try it out. Mm -hmm. Generate that code. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. We got a great show for you today. Talk to the very insightful, the very spiritual Stefan Spencer, all about SEO at scale. Uh, and to usher in the light of his wisdom, uh, I want to rant and rave about what has been the stupidest idea I've ever seen, or I've seen in a long time. I'm going to say ever seen, but stupidest <laughs> idea I've seen in a long time. Let's warm things up for Stefan's aura of illumination with another one of Morty's pet peeves. So I didn't know what to name this segment, actually. Really? Yeah, because I, when I started to, so we have a bunch of different segments that we do on the show in case you're listening for the first time. Uh, and one of them is what's hot in SEO. Right. So I was going to do that. Okay. This was going to be what's hot in SEO, um, subdomain leasing, until I started writing up my, my outline and what I was going to talk about. And I, I could feel it building up, that like utter disgust, that, that revolting disgust in my belly was building up, and I knew this was not a what's hot in SEO moment. This was a prime piece of pet peeve meat to digest on. Okay, so I'm going to try to be quick with this uh, the best that I can because, well, if I don't, this episode will just be too long. So here we go. Subdomain leasing. It's been in the news uh, two or three times over the past a uh, month and a half, two months or so. Um, and subdomain leasing, what the heck is that, right? I'm sure you're going to tell us soon enough. I'm going to tell you right now. Okay, subdomain <laughs> leasing is is when company A or website A who owns a site um, and may not have a ton of backlinks or they don't have, you know, that site authority ranking juice 
So they go to Company B and they say, hey, Company B, can I siphon some of your authority and ranking juice by using a subdomain on your site for my content? And then Site B says, sure. Okay, so for example, in a recent Search Engine Land article, um, they were discussing the topic of subdomain leasing where a coupon site was leasing the subdomain from CNN. Yes, the new site. So the URL was coupons.cnn.com. So a coupon subdomain on the CNN domain. Get it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is where it gets insane. So you clicked on this whack out URL and you land on CNN's website. So you go to you type in your best coupons, you see coupons.cnn, you click and you end up on CNN's website. So you see you see the same header you normally see for when you click on like what's happening in North Korea, but instead of seeing content about the news, you see a list of coupons like retail me or not. It literally looks like that website with the CNN header. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. Okay, that's that's absolutely crazy. So I was going to talk to you about how Google's going to handle this and what's going to happen, I think, and all the fallout. And I will do that briefly in a moment. But I simply, I just can't get past the insanity of all of this. Like the, the whole thing is, is completely insane. I mean, is, is, is freaking CNN so desperate for a couple of pennies that they're willing to take their very long, established, full of authority, news-leading website? That ranks very well and basically turn into a corner prostitute. Wow. And I literally <laughs> mean that. I'm not trying to be comedic or dramatic. Okay, it's literally what CNN is doing. Okay, they're pimping their website, basically. <laughs> no, it's serious. You ever <laughs> pimping pimp my ride here? Pimp my website. <laughs> Throw some coupons on there. I mean, seriously, I don't, you have no idea what you rent out the subdomain. You have no idea what they're really going to do with that. Oh, they can do all sorts of crazy things with the content and the links and whatnot. You're really ri willing to take the risk of what this can do for your site, to, do, to your site, for a few pennies? I mean, it's CS CNN. Now, if you're really, really in the red, maybe you should think about revamping your content or something. I don't know. But if you're really, la if you're really lacking for money, just ask for handouts. Like, so it, you'd be better off going out on the corner in Manhattan and asking with a cup of, you know, the cop saying, uh, need money for news. Then you are uh, prostituting out your website for, for a coupon site. It, it's insane. CNN, what are you doing? Literally, what are you doing? Someone over there obviously thought it was a good idea. The question is why? You have to imagine, okay, that this, the, the SEO team is having convulsions when they see like their website doing this. Either that or they're basically a bunch of pimps in fur coats. <laughs> Like your 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 SEO team is a bunch of pimps, or they're freaking out. I, there's only there's no in between there. Oh my God. They're either wearing a hat with a big feather and fur coats, or they're saying, "Why are we doing this? Why are we with subdomain leasing? Are you insane? Are you crazy? I, I I mean, do you not care about your? If you're doing this, do you not care about your website? You're a world. I'm and I'm picking on CNN, and and I don't mean to pick on them in particular. Just that was the example in the um. Recent search engine land article, but mm -hmm. tons of websites do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're a world leader in whatever vertical you are in. Right. Okay, and you're offering a list of coupons for a new pink polka dotted jockstrap from Hanes. Like, what's happening here? Yeah, and you know what Google's gonna do here. You don't have to be a genius to figure this one out. Do you think Google is gonna do something about it? Okay. So, now technically. This nonsense, believe it or not, mm. is not against Google's guidelines, oh, really? which is to me is amazing because it, it, it boggles the mind considering some of the things that are against Google's guidelines, and this is not. <laughs> Does that make any sense? That's what I mean. Like this is like my, the perfect pet peeve segment. Mm. I mean, I, I just don't understand it. Okay, but let's, let's focus okay. on what might happen mm -hmm. and what's definitely going to happen here. So John Mueller was asked about this maybe a month ago. I'm John Mueller from Google. So he said to quote, yeah. it's a little bit of a long quote, so bear with me. Okay. okay. The other aspect that always plays into these kinds of configurations on websites, meaning subdomain leasing, is when it comes to quality, we try to look at the quality of a website overall. 
So if there are particular parts of a website that are really low quality, I don't know if these are like really low quality coupon sites, for example, which is amazing that you picked up that example, wow. where the coupons are essentially just the same thing as everywhere else on the site or everywhere else on the web, then overall, that could be degrading the quality of the site a little bit. Okay? So let me translate this for you. We are going to demote the crap out of sites that are doing this as soon as we get the algorithm adjusted accordingly. And you know what, Google? You should do that. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm always for the website. I'm for the little man. <laughs> I'm always for the website. But in this case, Google, you should penalize the cr- or de- not penalize. It's a bad way of saying it. You should demote the rankings of these sites. I mean, you literally, if you're a website doing running coupons when you're a world news leader, you literally don't care about your website. Right. Okay, you're willing to sell yourself for a couple of bucks when you don't even need it. Right. Okay, you're CNN. You don't need the money. Why in the world would we think that you're in the business of providing quality content if we're Google? Right. Okay? Which, by the way, this is... Perfect timing. The quality reader guidelines got updated, and guess what became part of the YMYL category? News content. Okay? Why would we think Google, or why would you think CNN, if I'm Google, why would I think, why would we think that you're in the business of offering safe quality content when you're willing to sell your site? For coupons, so a coupon. It's not even related. I understand you want to re- lease out your subdomain, whatever, for whatever, for something that makes sense. I kind of get that. Mm-hmm. Okay, but coupons. You're a coupon site now, right? In in the case of a big bomber like CNN, I would imagine Google's still gonna think they're a news authority. But I, I have to imagine it's going to call some of their content into into higher suspect, and it's going to have to have some sort of impact on their rankings overall. Okay, think of think about it like this. It's like adding a bit of water to a cup of orange juice. It just doing something like subleasing to a coupon site. It just dilutes the overall potency of what you've got there on your website overall. Why? Because again, the most important thing John said here was, and again quoting, mm-hmm. the other aspect that always plays into these kind of configurations on websites is when it comes to quality. We try to look at the quality of the website, most important word, overall. And yes, as you know, I'm all in the idea of Google profiling your site, seeing what who you are, what's your site's identity, what's the um un, what's the topical substance of your site, what is the almost like an entity like understanding of those topics, and seeing what you're putting out there aligns to what you are, who your site is, what are the nature of the topics that you're talking about. And I'm pretty damn sure CNN doesn't say they're offering you the best coupons on a back hair beard trimmer. I see you did your research about back hair trimmer coupons. Right. Oh, God. How, how, do, I, <laughs> how do I delete a mental image, Morty? Of a back hair beard trimmer? Yeah. <laughs> you're stuck with that one for a while. Oh, my God. You and my wife. <laughs> Oh, I just don't, I really, I just, I just don't understand why these sites would do that. Right. You, it takes away from your main content of what you're trying to do, who you say you are. When Google looks at a topic and they think, okay, what's the nature of this topic? Almost like an entity-like understanding of what is, a, what is relevant, what is this topic that you're talking about, what does it extend to, what is it all about, and your site, does that fit to what your site is supposed to be doing? And when Google looks at that and says, okay, you're talking about world peace here and war over here and this terrible tragedy and hurricane this and hurricane that, and you're about it, you're a news site. And all that goes into understanding all of these things. And then Google says, well, well then why are you showing coupons? Right. It's got to take away from what you're doing. It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, let's see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Um, on to a more positive message because that was really <laughs> negative. <Depressing>. <laughs> <laughs> That was dark. <laughs> um, we have the one, the only Stefan Spencer um, talking to you about what it means to run a successful SEO operation at scale. Cut one. 
Welcome to another In Search SEO podcast interview session. Today we have with us a living legend. He is the co-author of The Art of SEO, among many other titles. He is the host of not one, but two marketing podcasts. He is a prolific SEO speaker. He is Stefan Spencer. How are you? Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely my pleasure. Um, so so you are a, a fascinating person to me. You've been around the SEO industry since its infancy. And at the same time, you have this sort of wonderful inner balance and harmony to you. And I'm just wondering, before we get started with the, the SEO stuff, if you could sort of speak to how all of that came about, both professionally and, and personally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great question. So I was um, going through a dark time in my life in 2009. I was going through a divorce I'd been in the SEO industry for a while by then. I'd spoken at a lot of conferences and stuff since the 90s. Uh, and I just was uh, not feeling super resourceful. Several friends, all within a two or three work week time period, all told me to go to a Tony Robbins event. I'm like, who? What? <laughs> well, what? <laughs> uh, but yeah, they. I thought this was not coincidence because three different people who don't know each other all telling me to go to some Tony Robbins event. I uh, thought he was just some infomercial guy, but I was like, all right, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And that started my whole journey of personal transformation. I did essentially a complete life reboot. And over the course of that next 10 months, I became unrecognizable from the guy I was previously in to the point to the, to the extreme that I would show up at SEO conferences and people wouldn't recognize me anymore. That was pretty cool. That has to be a uh, weird feeling. Uh, it was, it was entertaining. It was kind of weird, but it was, <laughs> it, it was, uh, it was fun. Like I, I remember being at SMX East in 2010 and nobody recognized me. I would, would join a group of people who were already talking and I'd just be listening to them and they wouldn't know who I was until <laughs> like five minutes into it and I let them know. So that was pretty fun. Um, but that physical transformation just was a small part of the overall transformation because then a couple of years later I went to India on a Tony Robbins platinum partner trip. I joined his high level program, very expensive, but totally <laughs> worth it. I ended up meeting my wife uh, through uh, the platinum partnership. Well, that, that is totally worth it. Totally worth it. Right. right? And uh, also, I got a spiritual uh, like awakening from the Platinum Partnership uh, experience as well. So that was on a trip to India that we took. And it was a monk who touched me on the head, gave me what they call a diksha, a oneness blessing. And I... It was almost like an out-of-body experience. It's kind of impossible to really describe, but I felt this deep sense of connection and calm, and it explained afterwards that monks that the divine is an experience, not a belief. So I, like I that. totally get that now. And uh, I went outside shortly after. I remember seeing the grass and the trees and everything, and everything was so brilliant green, like like a cartoon, technicolor green. It was just the most bizarre but beautiful uh, thing, and that w started a whole spiritual uh, transformation for me. And so I'm big into Kabbalah now. Oh. And got, um, so the, the other show, as you mentioned, I have two marketing podcasts. I actually have one marketing podcast, Marketing Speak, and the other one is a personal development spirituality and biohacking podcast oh, and productivity too. So that one I've had three Kabbalah episodes. I've had one, uh, oneness episode with one of the monks from India that, uh, uh, did not the one who did the Diksha on me that got me the spiritual awakening, but one who gave me a, a, a different Diksha, uh, at another time at the event it was just an incredible journey. And I wanted to share that with uh, a wider audience. So the podcast was the way to do that. I'm also working on a book, a uh, book about that journey and how we live in a friendly universe. And as somebody who is a former skeptic and, and very scientific and not 
spiritual at all, really agnostic and turned spiritual. That I think will be an interesting book. And I, I interview all these people for the book. I might as well turn those into podcast episodes. Mm-hmm. So that's what started the whole podcast called Get Yourself Optimized. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. I, I, I can speak to this a little bit personally, not to the same extent as you, but that, that inner transformation, and it sort of hits you from nowhere. That, that, that It's almost like a, a bolt of lightning almost the way I'll describe it personally, where you see something very clearly and something really meaningful, and your whole way of thinking can actually change. It's a really cool experience if you haven't experienced it yourself. Um, yeah. I want to, from that, let's get into something a little bit more mundane. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the succeeding at, uh, at, at SEO at scale, or I'll call it sort of the forgotten essence of SEO at scale, because I have a million questions I want to ask you, but I, I've boiled them down to just a few. Um, okay. But before we get started, I always try to make sure that my audience is up to speed and on the same page. When we speak of SEO at scale, what do we generally mean by that? Well, if you have, uh, let's say, more than a million pages to your site, or if you have uh, uh, numerous sites in your portfolio, or you're in the business of, let's say, acquiring sites, or uh, online businesses, or brokering them, or you're a VC, or some sort of uh, private equity firm type company that works with portfolio companies and those portfolio companies are running on different platforms and some are larger and some are smaller sites and so forth. And you want to roll out SEO across more than just uh, a a small number of pages that you, you, you just don't have the ability to touch each page individually by, you know, human uh, SEOs. It's just there's there's no scale to be able to do that. That's the kind of issue that uh, I think is very interesting to solve. Yeah, and there's so many unique considerations that come about that both on the technical side and I'll call it more on the holistic side. And I have a lot of questions on, on the latter. Being that you sort of are this person who has all of this experience in SEO and has a very cool outlook on life at the same time. So I thought maybe I'll sort of combine the two um, okay. the, best that I, the best that I can. We'll see how this works. So one of the things that I, I always see people discuss when they talk about SEO at scale is is automation and technical considerations, you know, site structure, that sort of things. But I want to go maybe in a little bit of a different direction here and talk about um, team development. Because when you're dealing with a large site, or if you're managing multiple large sites, if you're not working in-house, um, it, there's, there needs to be an overarching strategy. Um, a part, a part of doing SEO at scale and a major part of that is how you build your, your team. To what extent do you think other factors outside of those technical considerations that we always hear about or automation, those sort of more holistic things, team building and so forth, where do they fit into succeeding with SEO at scale? That's the cornerstone, I would say. Like one of my clients, for example, owns 1,800 websites. Wow. And... Uh, They have a big internal team. They work with a number of agencies, uh, a bunch of uh, individual freelancers and uh, uh, companies that kind of uh, aggregate freelancers and stuff. So it's it's an interesting problem. Uh, And the the thing that is, is the kind of foundation of success in that kind of scenario is having really solid SOPs, standard operating procedures, mm-hmm. uh, even con- uh, transforming those SOPs from big documents that people only read once or once in a while to something that people operate off of on a daily basis. And that would be to utilize tools like Process Street and make these checklists that are interactive and the prerequisites or the dependencies are baked into the um, the uh, the checklist, right? So you can do that with Process Street or Sweet Process, or you know, there's there's multiple tools that allow you to do that. But it makes the SOP into something that's more of a living document. You need to think about who is on the team and who uh, needs to be on the team. What the uh, success metrics are for each team member what the handoffs are, where that person's job ends and the next person's job begins, uh, what are their roles 
and responsibilities, and those are different things, uh, roles versus responsibilities, um, actually getting their buy-in and maybe even get them to write up their roles, responsibilities, success metrics, and handoffs uh, themselves, and then you provide guidance on that, and you also do um, a, a values determination process. I, I like using Dr. Martini's process for that, and he's got an online tool on drdmartini.com for determining your values hierarchy. So let's say that you know that somebody has a, a, a highest value around family, right? Or their highest value is, is their church or their religion or their highest value is, is world travel or whatever it is, then you can map that highest value to their roles and responsibilities. So let's mm -hmm. say that you have uh, like a VA type person on the team, virtual assistant, who um, they, they do some travel bookings for you and let's say travel is one of their highest values. They want to travel the world someday, do a round the world trip. And you teach them how to get the best deals on sites like Priceline, how to use specialized tools that most people don't know about, like autoslash.com to book your car rentals uh, because it does this comparative search and it knows all the special discount codes for uh, if you like have a Costco card and all that sort of stuff, AAA, et cetera. So you learn all these hacks and uh, travel hacks as a VA and that happens to be one of your highest values is travel and you're like, wow, this is amazing and you're totally engaged and, and you feel functional ownership. Uh, so functional ownership, I get that term from the book From Impossible to Inevitable, uh, which is by Aaron Ross. Uh, I interviewed him on my podcast, a great episode. Uh, so anyways, the idea here of getting the team members to feel like they're functional owners so they're not renting their jobs like they rent a car and they beat it up and they don't care about it and they don't bother washing it etc to owning their jobs mm -hmm. like the car that they own that they do take care of so getting that team structure getting them in the right seats and the bus that's uh, uh, an analogy from uh, the book from good to great uh, the, the, oh, also another great book about um, kind of building the systems and structures and so forth to have a successful scalable business. It, one of the most important books to read about this is the E-Myth, the Entrepreneur Myth. So the E-Myth, uh, well actually the E-Myth Revisited and also Beyond the E-Myth, both of those titles by Michael Gerber. Like you don't want to, for example, try to fix your existing business, building all the systems and so forth into that. You want to start over with kind of a skunk works company, what he refers to as NUCO, and build your systems and SOPs and all that into that business first. That is a much more viable strategy. So you, you would do all this stuff to get the team right, working on the right things, and that sets you up to win. Whether you are trying to scale across millions of pages or you just have a 100-page website that is a serious revenue generator for you, given the scale that you're at, whatever the size of your business, whether you're a solo consultant listening to this or you're a marketing manager at a big company, this all applies. Because how do you scale otherwise if you're not mm -hmm. using the e -myth, or you're not using uh, the, the ideas from impossible to inevitable with the functional ownership and, and all that. So that's, that, that's the basis for, for success. It's not like the using the right SEO tool or ch checking the right metric. Like, Oh, I didn't think to check link velocity trends <laughs> or LVT and in, in uh, link research tools. I should have been checking that. Right. Yeah, um, I, I think I'm definitely speaking to the right person then about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, am I excited. You, you know, I, want, I wanted to jump into a lot of the ideas you just spoke about, about self-efficacy and um, people's values and how to allocate 
people as resources and so forth and so forth. But I want to sort of jump back maybe to a more meta question. And that is, and it's from my personal experience, I've, I've always wondered to, to what extent this applies. But um, when looking to build a team and looking to, to create a, a functional workspace, how much of that starts not just in your goals, you know, your team members' um, skill sets, your team members' likes, dislikes, um, their values, but does, how much does it start with you as the, the main person, the, the owner of the agency or the head of the SEO team with your values? Well, it's, it is definitely uh, the <laughs> – I'm not going to use the S word in the podcast, but there's this expression that that S word – <laughs> rolls downhill. So if you don't have great values or you're, you're all into shortcuts or trying to exploit the weird loophole until it closes, that is a virus that mm. spreads throughout the company. So it's very important that you get your head straight in terms of why you're doing something. You're not going to like take a thousand word blog post and turn it into a 3000 word blog post so that you can better monetize the page. And that's it. Like what's the least amount of work I can do to get it to 3000 words so that I can double or triple the traffic coming into this page and triple the revenue generated by this page is terrible in my right. opinion. Right. And if instead everything that you do is underpinned with the the idea of value generation or value creation. So it's like, how can I create massive value for the readers, for the community, for the world? How do I reveal more light in the world to tie in a Kabbalah concept? How can I do that with going from 1,000 to 3,000 words in the, uh, this blog post and do it cost effectively. So it's like, you know, there's, there's the old adage, how long is a piece of string, right? So you could work on that page forever and ever, like a website's never finished. So how do I not spend an inordinate amount of time optimizing and building this page out, expanding it, um, and get the, the monetary revenue, uh, that I need and, do massive value creation while I'm at it because that's the main driver of everything that you should do. So whether you're doing link outreach, how can I create massive value in my outreach emails? If I'm uh, setting up JV partnerships to increase my monetization, maybe I'm only relying on AdSense and I want to do some JV deals, how can I create massive value in putting those JV deals together? If I'm doing a, a, a state of the union meeting internally with my team, how can I create massive value in that? My content creation going from a thousand to 3000 words or building out my website from hundred pages to 5,000 pages. How can I create massive value? It's not about just trying to game the system. Right. And, and speaking of creating, you know, value when working with, when you, when you've set up your values for yourself and you set the values for your, your core values for your, for your company, and you're starting to hire people now, and you bring them onto your team. How do you go about bringing out that value in the employee? How do you? And, and to me, that means self fulfillment. Always, I mean, self fulfillment to me. The, one of the most massive, if not the most massive, driver of motivation is this idea that I am going to be fulfilled in a, in a meaningful way by doing this. How do you sort of foster that? How do you so, sort of foster self efficacy um, within the within the SEO setting? Yeah. So I want to understand what drives them, and that's part of what uh, every staff person has to do, the values determination process on the Dr. Martini site. They also need to do other uh, assessments like uh, Strengths Finder, so I, I, I know what their highest strengths are, their top five strengths. It's only like $19 for that test, something wow. uh, very inexpensive. So you, out of the 62 or so strengths, then you know their top five, and you can have them work on their their biggest strengths because you're setting them up for success. And if you could imagine here, like you, people want to feel successful. They want, uh, what, what, uh, BJ Fogg, who is one of the top behavior change experts in the world. Uh, he, he came up with this concept, this, this idea that there's an emotion that nobody has a name for, but he just named it. 
Uh, he's got a new book coming out, Tiny Habits. We're doing a workshop together, in fact, at Stanford on October 1st. So uh, folks who are interested in that, it's going to be amazing. You should totally sign up. But uh, <laughs> B.J. Fogg, world expert on behavior change. And this emotion that he named is called shine. Shine is the feeling you have when you're successful, right? So people right. stop using apps that make them feel less than successful. Like there's an app called Way of Life. And, and that Way of Life app was very helpful for uh, setting a, a new habit for me. But I stopped using it because when... Uh, you should, when you kind of fall off the wagon and stop doing the new habit, let's say it's a morning routine or whatever, and you stop being able to tech, uh, tick the green box, the check mark, and your your chain is broken of all the green checks, you feel failure. You feel like you let yourself down, and that's the opposite of yeah. shine. <laughs> yeah. And you stop using the app. So in everything that you do, uh, with your team, are you instilling more shine? It's kind of like the, do you know about Marie Kondo? The, yeah. the uh, life-changing magic of tidying up. That's her New York Times bestselling book. It's like sold many millions of copies. She's got a show on Netflix now. She's a big deal. And her concept is all about sparking joy. If you hold a book in your hand that's on your bookshelf and you're trying to decide, do I give this away or not? and you don't even open it up and start thumbing through it, you just hold it in your hand, you kind of like tap into that feeling of joy. Do I, does this spark joy for me or not? Or do I feel a sense of dread? Like oh, I really should have read this already and I haven't like get rid of it. If it doesn't spark joy, if the, if what you're doing to manage or better yet than manage lead your team member isn't sparking shine, you're on the wrong track. You're not being a good leader. So that is a huge game changer. Just knowing that shine exists and trying to build that and not just like align with their highest values. Cause of course you're doing that at the very beginning with, and, and checking in with them on a regular basis with the uh, per performance reviews and all that. But the values uh, mapping of their highest values to their job functions that's something that you do at the beginning of the job and then you check in performance reviews. How are we doing? How am I doing at tapping you into your highest values with what you do on a day to day basis? And then when you're doing things like uh, team meetings, I just had a state of the union meeting with my team and um, I, we went around uh, the, like virtually went around the, the room because we're all in different locations, <laughs> vir virtual company, but on Zoom, uh, after I gave my um, state of the union of where things are at and what, what uh, uh, excites me about the next um, quarter and so forth, then I uh, asked each person to share what their, um, what's what's exciting them and and what they're up to and what challenges they're facing and personal ones too like how can i help somebody who has a family member who's very very sick and um uh, like you know going probably going into hospice like oh well there was this um uh this this uh, blog post i read from brendan bouchard where he talked about interviewing family members before they pass and like parents and so forth. And, uh, here's the questionnaire that he used on his parents. And I shared that, uh, with the person, well, with actually the whole team, uh, as a follow up because one person was talking about that challenge and which was totally personal and, and is very important to them. It's not like, Oh, well, I really need access to this additional <laughs> tool because it's, uh, you know, we're going to make my job more, uh, make me more effective at my job. No, you're, you missed the point. Yeah. Uh, like people are humans. They're not robots. You gotta, you gotta really truly care about them. Yeah. That's a, that's an amazing point. Um, there's so much to say about this, but yeah, there's a certain sense. I think that we've, we've moved away from, I don't know as a society in general. I feel if I'm, if I'm over my bounds as a, uh, sociological commentator, then forgive me, but we've sort of forgotten in a way what it means to exist or to sort of tap into that ineffable sense of I exist. And I think that's what you mean by joy and shine. There's a certain sense that you're, you're tapped into like 
of, of actual existence. And I don't have a better way to describe that, but one of the ways to fulfill it is, is through work. Work is a very, in a way, work is a very spiritual thing, oddly enough. And I, it's yeah. a monumental task to sort of cater to that and to sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Cultivate and foster that you sense know, it's of... It's funny you say that because I just, three days ago, I was spoke at Affiliate Summit East and one of the uh, things I said in, in the session was that business is a spiritual game. Mm. And, and that's really struck people. In fact, I had people come up afterwards and like, well, what do you, tell me more about that. That really, that, that resonated with me. So I think of business as a spiritual game uh, or spiritual discipline where you're out there in the world either revealing light or not and uh, adding value or not. And if you're just trying to, again, like exploit the weird loophole or whatever, like the, like the, the trader who's day trading and not actually adding any value, uh, just trying to exploit, uh, to, to exploit the weird uh, loopholes, the, the things that are, are um, uh, just like moments in time where they can just jump in and, and make a bunch of money before everybody else, like using automated trading platforms or whatever. Where's the value creation in that? How are they revealing light in that? That's not going to last. It's not going to uh, have long-term viability. And I know this sounds pretty woo-woo, um, <laughs> but I, I, I think it plays out uh, really well. You know, just like if you don't have uh, the, the, the customers or the clients or the visitors' best interests at heart, you will lose. It's just yeah. a matter of time. And uh, even just business uh, philosophy will bear that out. You look at what Jay Abraham teaches, for example, the concept of preeminence. Like if, if the prospect is better served by being sent to your competitor, you send them to your competitor. Right. Right. It's a, it's a different notion of winning, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you then, because of what you just said, when you're looking to, at, a, at a new team member, prospective employee, how, how, how much are you looking at their knowledge and skill set versus how much are you looking at their disposition or their, their values and attitude? Uh, I'm looking at a number of things. Um, it's, it's the values I can't change. Right. So I, I, I do this little test called the, the honesty test, and you can probably guess based on the name of it what the right answer is to this question. But let's say that I ask in the interview process, tell me what do you think uh, is the most important attribute for this position? Is it attention to detail, creativity, honesty, um, uh, dedication, technical acumen, which, which of those would, for this SEO position or this VA position or this link outreach position, which of those five is the most important attribute? The only right answer, take a guess. <laughs> Making a lot of money? No, I'm joking. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm going to go with honesty on that one. Yeah, because you cannot train honesty into somebody that you bring on board. Mm. So somebody who doesn't consider honesty as a super uh, high value, very important attribute, they're going to do stuff like cut corners. They're going to uh, maybe be surfing Facebook and doing personal stuff, uh, buying things on Amazon for um, personal reasons while on the company clock. They're just, that's how things are going to play out. So you're not going to fix that. Same thing with if, if somebody doesn't uh, feel a sense of ownership in their life or a sense of personal agency. They don't. They're not a go-getter. They're not. Um, they don't feel responsibility. And I'm using responsibility very um, that that word very deliberately because it's being response able able to respond. Like and that. and that. That's not just like, okay, it's my duty or obligation to do this thing or even like, oh, you know, I'm, I don't want to be to blame for this if this goes off the rails or I, I want credit for this if it's a, if it's a win. No, it's, it's a higher level. Responsibility 
like true responsibility is about being cause in the matter. If it needs to be done, well, it needs to be done. Like, if not me, then who? Right, and if right. not now, then when? when? Like the, the I, I remember getting this lesson at a workshop uh, taught by Ephraim Olszewski, who uh, just seven figure uh, coach. You have to spend a minimum of six figures uh, paid up front, no refunds, to hire him to get coaching uh, an hour a week uh, or to work with your executive team for seven figures a year. Again, no refunds. Uh, <laughs> amazing guy. He is awesome. So I learned from him this concept of responsibility. And I had this breakthrough at, in, the, in the men's room during the break. Okay. There's a to- uh, the, uh, the, next to the, the, um, the sink, there's the, the soap dispenser, right? And right. the soap dispenser was empty. Ooh. There was enough to get the tiniest That's bit the out. Now, the previous version of me, prior to the workshop, would have just said, oh, that sucks. Try and eke out the last little drop of soap and wash my hands and then get back in the room. Nope. I felt responsible. Mm-hmm. Responsible. So I found a, a, you know, with a house phone or whatever to contact housekeeping. This was at a hotel. And said, hey, there is a problem in the men's room on the whatever floor. It's out of soap. And, oh, thank you. Appreciate you letting us know. And then I knew it would get handled. Right. Because somebody after me is going to be affected by that. That's an amazing outlook on life. I don't think it would. I, I'll, I'll, I'll frankly admit it. I probably would have used up the soap and walked out the door. Yeah. So you want people who you want to screen for people who feel like I'm responsible in that higher level capacity and the skills are so secondary. Mm-hmm. Like if somebody is, uh, I don't know, a liberal arts major and they get around fine on the computer, they're like comfortable, but they don't know about all the SEO tools. They, uh, they think SEO is about keywords and like, okay, you're hungry to learn so mm-hmm. and you're motivated and this isn't you know you personal passion for this and so forth okay so that's all in place and you're uh you answer the right kind of values questions and honesty and all that sort of stuff you're in i'll yep. give you a trial period and and uh some trial projects and stuff like that because i always want to make sure that to, cause somebody might interview really well and then they suck at the job. Oh yes. So you you want to have a trial period or trial project. Anyway, so I want that person. I don't want the person who like knows all the tools, knows all the different features and all the metrics. And of course, if, if somebody is trying to fake me out, like uh, this was a great question I asked. Uh, uh, so I interview uh, a second interview candidates a lot of times on on behalf of my client. So they're trying to bring in an in house SEO. And they want me, the SEO expert, to interview the guy or gal to make sure that they're not blowing smoke. Okay. And so I ask a question like, tell me, what, what are your favorite SEO tools? <laughs> and I remember this one guy said, oh, Majestic SEO uh, as his favorite. I'm like, okay, so the little spidey sense was already tingling because he said Majestic SEO, which was the previous name for Majestic. So I already thought, that's not good. <laughs> and then I asked him, all right, so what's the, in, in Majestic, what's that metric that is really important? Could, you know, just remind me of that. Of course, I knew, uh, trust flow and citation flow are two metrics. So I was already kind of leading the witness there. And he, I knew it. I knew it. AC rank was his answer. Uh-huh. Eh, what? That metric was deprecated three years ago. This is your favorite SEO tool, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't tell him any of that. I just quickly wrapped up the rest of the interview because it was a complete waste of time. This guy was a liar. Right. So that that bugs me. Yeah, if yeah, you yeah. just if you come clean and say, you know what, I don't have a favorite SEO tool because I'm new to this space, but I've been reading Search Engine Land and Search Engine Journal, and I've started reading your book stuff and I'm on chapter two and I really like X, Y, and Z in that chapter. Okay. That's cool. I can work with that. But so, don't lie to me. 
that's 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 a good piece of of advice across the board. I think in your life, don't lie to people. Yeah. O- outside of honesty and outside of, um, you know, it, actually, it is interesting. I'm gonna jump back actually. In the SEO space, and I've personally benefited from this, there's a, a large chunk of people who didn't come into the industry. They weren't data scientists. They weren't computer, you know, they weren't major in anything to do with, you know, computer scientists or anything like that. I came through through the content end. There, there are so many people like this. Do you think that one of the, I guess, maybe the unique traits about SEO is the ability or is the, um, the ability to assimilate people who are not coming from a technical background into the industry, which on the flip side meaning is one of the major um, um, tendencies or one of the major traits that you can have coming into SEO is the ability and the drive to learn more than other other industries, for example. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, well, I, th- I think it's, again, a kind of a personality trait, that hunger to learn and grow. And that's the kind of person you want to employ in your company or that you want to contract with or the agency you want to work with. Right. That your team that's been assigned to you, the account manager, the consultants, the analyst, and all that, they have that hunger, that drive to learn and grow. And if they have that, then you're you're set because you just make sure that they have the tools and the the upskilling available to them. Like they're going to the conferences, they're they're accessing the online trainings and courses and stuff. Like I have uh, a 20 hour online course on uh, do it yourself SEO auditing. And so if they're finding these tools, uh, finding these, these resources, and even if they're just free, like some people just learn for free off of my learning center on stephanspencer.com instead of uh, buying the courses. And that's totally fine too. I just want to see that that hunger's there and again, I'm, I'm looking at their strengths as well. I'm using Strengths Finder to assess that. I'm also looking at their cognitive abilities, which is different from cognitive abilities. Um, cognitive, uh, 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 the, the test for that is Colby, K-O-L-B-E. And you can find out, for example, if you score really high as a fact finder, you score really high as a quick start. Like I'm super high quick start. I love starting stuff but I hate finishing it. I need the cleanup person behind me. That's why I have a team because I can't, I, I want to focus on my strengths. I want to be in my zone of genius and, and not just in my zone of competency. Yeah, I could finish everything, but I want my cleanup crew to do all the implementation and um, uh, grunt work stuff that after I've developed the, the crazy brilliant strategy for the content marketing campaign that gets tons of uh, high trust links. So that is what you're, you're scanning for and trying to get the right fit. Again, the right, uh, right person in the right seat on the bus and not just the right people on the bus. Yeah. And there's no substitute for self-awareness in that case. Yeah. I want to jump onto um, more onto a point you spoke about before, which was um, evaluating your team and and progressing them, moving them along. And one of the things that I find is in general, and nothing to do with SEO in particular, is that the way we analyze people in the workplace, the way we relate to them is you know, very quantitative, very results driven. And the way we assess them is, is based on their results per se. And we sort of forget to look at the person themselves and what they need to grow and what they need to develop. So how do you go about doing that in, in the SEO setting? How do you go about developing your team, your team members and Sort of nudging them and guiding them along the the process, so that you so, so that they can be where you want them to be. Yeah, well, it goes from being activity oriented or uh, activity focused to outcome focused. And once you and the team are all outcome focused, the game changes. the The need to have the quantitative measures uh, kind of drops. It doesn't completely go away, but it becomes much more qualitative. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you've been delegating tasks of writing, ghost writing articles uh, for uh, some uh, website that you contribute to. Okay, so you got this ghost writer, and that person is producing uh, three articles a week or whatever, right? So that person is just delivering, delivering, delivering quantitatively 
on the uh, re the understanding the requirements uh, for their position. But there's no functional ownership. There's no uh, understanding or buy-in to the bigger picture. Like as the business owner, if those articles don't end up getting published, it was worthless. Mm -hmm. The quantitative metrics are irrelevant because there was no result. There was no outcome. So you have to, you as the leader in the company or the leader of your department or whatever, it's your job to delegate the outcome and not the tasks. So then it becomes about the qualitative and not the quantitative. They feel that that sense of ownership and and uh, agency in their destiny because now you've got them to buy into the bigger picture on what's happening and the why. Why do I need to keep contributing to this website? What's the value? What's what makes it relevant to the company and to me in my position that uh, this makes sense to me? And then you're not having to babysit every step of the process. Like, yeah, all right, you, you drafted those articles, but you did, you forgot to submit them to the editor for uh, proofreading. Yep. Oh, oh, oops, sorry about that. But they, they were task oriented and not f focused on the outcome, right? So then uh, if, that, if that's the situation, they're task oriented, you need all the quantitative metrics, like, uh, how many words uh, produced and what's the cost per word and um, you know, what, what's their total output per week and, and articles and are they hitting the deadlines and all that. But that totally misses the point. That's all yeah, tactics yeah. and there's no strategy there. My favorite line from The Art of War is hmm. tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. Yeah, Sun Tzu wrote that like whatever hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's so so powerful and applicable today. So you could be focused on all the tactics and the stuff that happens at the ground level and miss the entire big picture and the whole war. You lose the war. Yeah, and, and it's 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 not possible to manage things that way. If someone's not bought in and they're not looking to really drive home what they're doing, you'll, you'll never be able to micromanage them to the point where you feel happy. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of this, uh, this Dilbert cartoon. Are you from uh, Dilbert. Fan of Dilbert? Yeah. Yeah. So there's this one where pointy haired boss is standing behind Dilbert who's in front of the computer with his hand on the mouse and pointy haired boss has his hand on Dilbert's hand. So that's the epitome of micromanagement, right? right? <laughs> that's great. Yeah, so don't that. do that. <laughs> Uh, all right, so to quote the great Bob Dylan, the hour is getting late, and I want to end off with a little bit of a game that I do with all my guests. I, I call it Optimize It or Disavow It, and it's basically a little fun little thing that I do where I give you two options, and it's a zero-sum world. So either I'll give you two great options, and you're stuck choosing between one great option over another great option, uh, or I'll give you two really bad, crappy options, and you're stuck choosing between two really uncomfortably bad options. Um, so this, if you're willing to indulge us, is the Stefan Spencer version of Optimize It or Disavow It. So I, being that we're an SEO tool and I have completely steered this conversation away from SEO tools, which you can now never accuse me of trying to just plug myself purposefully at end. Um, I do want to bring it up for one quick second in a weird, fun sort of way. So SEO at scale, again, every conversation is going to talk about um, you know, automation and tools and so forth, which is why we didn't do that. But I will ask you, if you had to choose, you can either have way too many tools at your disposal or way too many um, people, way too many members of your staff, which is worse for, if, for um, efficiency, which is worse for producing SEO results at square at scale. Too many yeah, people. That's, too many tools. That's easy. Yeah, that's so easy. Too many people. Too many people. You know, you know the the old adage, uh, "Too many cooks in the kitchen." Oh yes. Or, or another one I love even more is uh, a "Camel is a horse designed by committee." <laughs> I don't think I've heard that one. Yeah, yeah. So that's what you're gonna you're gonna end up with a camel. 
if uh, you've got too many team members. And there's also Parkinson's law in, at play. Parkinson's is, law says that um, the uh, the work or the 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 project will um, expand or shrink to fit the budget and the time frame given to it. So, I mean, that's a paraphrasing, very rough paraphrasing of the of Parkinson's law. You can Google it. There's a whole Wikipedia page on it. But the idea here is, if you want something done fast and efficiently, uh, give it to the busy person and give it to them uh, with a, a, a very aggressive deadline. Right. They'll say, well, they're, they're really busy, so I'm going to give them extra long to work on this because they will take extra long to get it to you and take extra long hours to produce it. Whereas if you say, well, well what's the, to get quality, let's really be aggressive here and let's say I need it by Friday and um, you know, whatever other parameters, and you will get it. <laughs> it's really good. So Parkinson's law works. And, and if you have too many team members, uh, then the, do you have the opposite happening and it's just going to be a train wreck. So you heard it here first. You should get SEO automation tools like Rick Ranger. I'm joking. <laughs> no, you totally should. <laughs> <laughs> I love Rank Ranger. Yeah. And I love uh, how you guys have a feature where you can – uh, track your YouTube search rankings, and there are not very yeah. many uh, ranking trackers uh, no. can can state that. And what's the number two search engine? But YouTube. YouTube so you right. definitely want uh, to track your YouTube rankings. And we just added a tool very recently, um, uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, uh, where you can look at we call it the SERP feature monitor, where you can track um, SERP features like the um, feature snippets, um, the related questions box, and also the video carousel, or the video box, we would like to call it, and see what keywords bring it up and how consistently and which URLs Google is placing within it so you can optimize for YouTube. And at the same time, you should always try to optimize for the video box on the SERP. So check I love that, that. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I, I'm I'm really big into uh, featured snippet optimization. Oh, yes. I've got uh, a couple of search engine land articles on that, uh, which I can give you, and you can add yeah, in the show notes absolutely. if you'd like. Uh, one actually one is to test your knowledge. You're a featured <laughs> snippets expert because featured snippets isn't just position zero in the SERPs that preempts all the organic results. It's also the voice answer. Right for right. voice search and that's that's huge yeah, that's, you want to be normal. the answer i've always wanted to do a study i haven't had a chance time to do this yet but to see how often they 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 like where how often they align notice because google can pull a snippet from from really anywhere it could be a feature snippet on desktop there could be a different snippet on mobile which one would google use when doing a voice search are they going to pick up if there's a different url on mobile and they can use a mobile or they can use a desktop feature snippet it's always been a I don't, curiosity yeah, that's of an mine. Interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, do you do you see that often where the featured snippet is different between desktop and mobile? So I'm, I just finished the research on this very recently. That's why I'm bringing it up. Depends how you look at it. Uh, from a URL to URL, like if if there's a URL on both desktop and mobile, they usually match. Uh, I think it's somewhere around the ninety percent range. Yeah, yeah, I would expect that. Yeah, but there are a lot. If you insert the days where there's just a desktop feature snippet and not a mobile feature snippet, then you're down to something like seventy-five percent. Gotcha. But what about different featured snippets between desktop and mobile? That's what I'm saying. They, they, there's only that only so shows up. So having one and not having one, that's a, a slightly different scenario than yeah. having a different site occupying the featured snippet. Right. So that too. only happens ten percent of the time. Okay. Yeah, Over a thirty-day period. Okay. Yeah, I rarely, rarely see that. Yeah, which is interesting because I was talking to somebody. I don't know if you know him, Nigel Stevens. I was just speaking with him. He, I said, "Wow, that's really interesting. What's the other ten percent of the time about? Like, why wouldn't it just be the same? Ninety-five, ninety-eight percent of the time." And he said, "Why is it so high? I would expect it to be a wider gap." No, I think it's. I, I think ten percent is very high. I think it's high also. I'm. I'm, yeah. I'm curious why that the. I can't imagine for an informational query, the intent being that drastically different. I understand something like, you know, commerce query. I'm not going to buy it on mobile. I'll wait till I'm on desktop. But you're looking for information. I understand the difference. Well, I would say that you'd want to put the same site reference as the resource that gave the answer in, in both almost all the time, both desktop and mobile. But then 
the presentation of the snippet would change depending on whether you're yeah. desktop or mobile. So like you'd want to get more succinct. You'd want to uh, utilize uh, fraggles of fragments uh, right. more and drive people directly to that little piece of the answer uh, and let them drill down for more. Uh, yeah. That would be more appropriate for mobile and not as necessary for desktop. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'll see how it goes. Yep. All right. So, so is this just the one question for this game, or do you have a whole no, bunch just, of them? Just the one. Totally no, 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 I'm, no. Just that one question. Just a little, oh, okay. you know, fun thing to end off with. All right. Awesome. Lighten, lighten the mood a little bit. Um, so we're good. All right. Yeah. Well, I feel. Well, I let, feel me, let me let me let me wrap. Wait. Let me let me just wrap this up officially. <laughs> Stefan, thank you very much for coming on the In Search SEO podcast. Great insights. Wonderful to talk to you. Really, really enjoyed that conversation. It was very meaningful. Oh, thank you. And, you know, to, to give our, our listeners something to take as a next action, if they're interested in using my approach to hiring and screening candidates or uh, team members, I have an SEO hiring blueprint and also an SEO BS detector. So I, I gave that one uh, test question as an example of what's your favorite SEO tools. Right. And But there's also ones where there's only one right answer, and it's a trick question. So uh, people who are just blowing smoke, or be, they'll be totally found out, even when they're being interviewed by somebody who doesn't know SEO, as long as they have that uh, BS detector document cool. in their hands. Very cool. So that, both of those I'll make available to your listeners, and I'll, I'll put that on marketingspeak.com slash in search got it awesome thank you really appreciate it yeah and we are back to your regularly scheduled in search seo podcast he has such an interesting both a really an interesting and sort of calming aura about him doesn't he mm -hmm. like the the, the, if you want to get into holistic seo or seo at scale or anything holistically about SEO and SEO overall, he is definitely the person you want to speak to about this. So that was a great conversation. I really, really enjoyed that. And you got to see a more spiritual side of Morty. Yeah. Because again, you will, naturally, you get my more sarcastic side. <laughs> right. But there are 70 faces, 70 layers to Morty. Good to know. Yes, oh, good no. to know. I like <laughs> what I heard myself in the third person. <laughs> God's sake. Okay. Uh, as you know. Miguel Omanya. <laughs> As I mentioned before. As you, right. Yeah. Uh, regular mania. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> right here. Me and Stalin. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the comparison. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> you compared yourself. You know, well, well, when you say you're more, you're megalomaniac. I think of like, I don't know, Charles Manson. Like, wh <laughs> who are you comparing me to exactly? You are your own category. Thank you. I swear. Yeah. I think, I think that is a good thing. Right. I'm unique. <laughs> you are. As you know. Yeah. Our interview sessions mm -hmm. naturally segment and flow into naturally. our yes the Rank Ranger community question of the week. So this week we this ask week, you we ask you <laughs> what works when helping to develop SEO talent? How do you help SEOs reach their full potential? Yeah, yeah. Okay. How do you get that talent going? It's mm. not so easy, right? Mm -hmm. You got some raw potential there. How do you get it out? I love to hear about this from both sides. By the way. Um, both as the person who the talent is being extracted from and the person trying to extract that talent. Right. I find that very curious to see how both sides look at that question. It is interesting. Yes. Um, by the way, before we move on to the news, let's take a look at uh, last week's question where we asked you. Oh, I meant to ask, say, I forgot. You can find the Rank Ranger SEO community question of the week on the Rank Ranger blog that harbors this very podcast on Twitter, on the Rank Ranger Facebook page, on the LinkedIn page, and so forth. I'll share it at some point here or there. So look forward to answering. If you want to answer anonymously, we have a Google form where you may do that. Mm -hmm. So look look for the shout out if you want to have your name there or if you just want to share some wisdom because you're altruistic like that mm -hmm. and you don't want to share your name, we have a Google form for you. Right. Okay. Last week we asked you if you're going to go with an SEO consultant, what's important to consider before you bring an SEO consultant on board? And um, Alexander Ratakovich, so that's A-L-E-K-S-A-N-D-E-R, uh, Ratakovich, R-A-T-K-O-V-I-C, from LinkedIn. Um, he is the CEO of Nerpano 10. He said... I would suggest to them 
meaning whoever is looking to bring the consultant on, um, you would ask what term the consultant site ranks for. That was an interesting way to take it, sort of test out the SEO consultant. Okay, you're so good. You're so good at SEO. What do you rank for? Right. And if your site, if your own site doesn't rank well, well then how are you going to make my site rank well? That's an interesting way to take that. The only thing I would say back to that sometimes is shoemaker's kids go shoeless. Mm-hmm. Right? So sometimes, like for example, you may spend a ton of time on someone else's site and doing their SEO, but you kind of forget to do SEO for your site. Right. But his point is very cool. I like that. What do you rank? What do you rank for? I'm paying you money. Let me see what you rank for first. Okay, Morty. You rank for some low volume, nothing query, blah, blah, blah. I'm hiring you. Should we just do the news? What? what? <laughs> like, what? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm trying to give you a way out. Should we just do the news? You're supposed to say, yes, uh, Morty, let's just do the news. Right, let's just do the news. Let's just do the news. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> From helping the team develop to keeping that team informed. Here is Sapir with the news. Google has updated its quality radar guidelines again. The changes include new content falling under the YMYL, your money, your life umbrella. Also, Google seems to want site to distinguish between content created by the site itself versus content that comes from an outside source. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things that, that really stuck out to me with the changes that Google un- updated or ch- uh, announced, or not announced because you, they didn't announce anything. You had to compare the <laughs> May version to the September version to see right. what changed, and some really cool people did that. One of the things that stuck out to me, though, was the idea of um, focusing less on pages and focusing more on topics. For example, the guidelines now say your money, your life, pages or YMYL, the following are examples of YMYL topics. He used to say pages. Now it says topics. Mm. Okay. So I think what you're going to see, because there is a, I know people will have a whole debate is what Google doing with the guidelines, part of the algorithm. Are they not part of the algorithm? Are they, I, I'm not getting into the debate now, but there's definitely a correlation between the two of them. A lot of the things we see Google doing in the guidelines, we're starting to see in the algorithm also. So whether or not it's part or not part, I'm not getting into it, but there's definitely some sort of, I'm not going to say relationship, but there's mm-hmm. definitely some sort of correlation between them. Mm-hmm. And and you see that here. I think you're going to see Google understanding page content both in the context of a site and in isolation of it. What do I mean? A page exists on a site. Okay, So Google's going to look at the site overall and say, okay, does this page make sense for this site? Um, if this site's authoritative, then this page is generally going to be authoritative. So Google looks at content in the context, like John just said in what we said in the uh, quote in the first segment, as part of the site overall. But Google's also looking at the content in isolation. And I think what's happening is is that Google has a much better way of understanding topics. And we've talked about this on the podcast um, in previous episodes where Google is going to say, or Google does say, and I know there's a lot of correlations between the quality rate or guidelines and, and the algorithm. Is it part of the algorithm not part of But just, just listen to what I'm saying, okay? Google has a better way, and John Mueller is talking about this, of understanding topics. Okay, When we speak about whatever topic it is, let's say it's diabetes. I always fall back on diabetes. When we look at diabetes, we're, we're Google, and we're looking at diabetes, we're going to look and see, how does diabetes, when you talk about diabetes, how is that generally spoken about? What's the general tone? How, how do you structure your content when you talk about that topic? Because Google's looking at a vertical and saying, okay, how is that vertical usually looked at or discussed? What does authoritative content for this topic sound like? What does it look like? Literally, what is it? How is it formatted? As opposed to Google saying, okay, so this topic consists of these keywords. Okay, that's that's simple. Okay, we're not looking at it from a keyword perspective anymore. It's almost as if Google is looking at a topic as an entity. What is this entity? What is this topic? What does it include? Not only what does it include, but how is it discussed? What does content sound like for this entity, for this topic? What does content look like for this topic, for this entity? Now, if, you, I, if I'm Google and I have an idea of what this entity is and what it's supposed to look like and what it's supposed to sound like, and if what you're, when the way you present this entity, and I'm using the word entity and topic interchangeably, right, how, does it, how does it look on your site? How does it sound like on your site? How does it come across on your site? And if it doesn't match up, I don't care how authoritative your site is, 
I don't care how great your site is. I don't care how much this topic aligns to what you do in your site. If the topic is not from a holistic perspective, what it's supposed to sound like and look like, then Google's not going to rank the page. Meaning Google's looking at things. Yes, this page is part of an overall site, but it's getting a far greater, more holistic understanding of what a topic, what a vertical is supposed to look like and sound like. And I think that's being reflected in the quality reader guidelines. And that's why you have a switch from page to the word topic. And I don't mean to digress too much. So moving on. Sorry. Okay, let's yeah. move on. Um, My whole analysis on the new <laughs> YMY, on the new uh, quality reader guidelines. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I did shoot way too much time off with that one. It's okay. Okay. Thanks for bearing <laughs> with me. We appreciate your, you know, comments. And Do you really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah, move on. Yeah. Google was spotting showing a competitor-based carousel at the very top of a local panel. Ooh. Mm, meaning the competitor carousel appeared above the featured business's very name. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about this in a blog post that I just wrote and I want it's going to come out. I have to look at my calendar about zero-click search we spoke about last week. So I'm not going to comment it here because we're running out of time. Okay. Onwards. Google has introduced auto DNS verification. Google is partnering with a series of domain name registers to help exp uh, expedite the verification process. Okay, great. I do have comments, but we're out of time. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lastly, Google is rolling out a new movie SERP feature. For queries like what to watch, Google is showing a top picks for you carousel, which brings up an overlay of shows you can swipe through. Really, really interesting feature. A lot to talk to about this. And mm -hmm. by the way, Google also released um, a movie structured um, schema, structured markup you can insert. That's a whole other thing. I've said this for a while. I, I've got to find the blog post where I talked about this. But I, I definitely talked about this. Google has... A, is looking to create an app-like feel for the mobile SERP. It doesn't want, okay, good, keeping your ecosystem, blah, 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 that's true. It, I, it's using the mobile SERP like you would use an app. And right. this is a quality example of that checkout. You'll see the link in the blog posts that we have for this. You'll click it, you can see what it actually looks like. It's rolling out only in the US so far. That's Amazing. The, yeah. Yeah, that's the news. it for all the right, news. All right, good for the news. Okay, we gotta move on because we're taking too much time today. Okay, okay. All right, all right. Uh, time for the fun SEO send-off question. We're in a rush, so roll music. All right, what do we got today, Sapir? Okay. You, you, did, you did it again, huh? I did it again. Oh, look at you <laughs> taking over this segment. Thank you, oh, Lord. Oh, God. Okay. So today, yes. we're asking. We're, you're asking. <laughs> okay. Okay. Which reality TV should Google star in? Which reality TV show? Show. You just said which reality TV. Sorry. <laughs> The reality TV show. Show. Right. Right. Okay. Let's not confuse the audience here. <laughs> Which reality TV show should Google star in? That's so obvious. Okay. Show. Big show Brother. Uh huh. Duh. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but not as a generally ignorant, over sexualized 20 something, but as actually like the Big Brother itself. <laughs> like the camera for obvious reasons. Yeah, obvious reasons. Because Google's right. not a generally <laughs> ignorant, overly sexualized 20 something. That's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually sure you're gonna say the Kardashians since really? you're such an avid fan. Okay, so I mentioned to you this <laughs> week that I knew who Kim Kardashian is. You said you were a fan. Now. I did not. <laughs> I said I knew who she was. That's my word and, against and yours. I, and then I asked you to say, I had to ask you, name me another <laughs> Kardashian, and I don't know any other ones except for the father, who's OJ's lawyer. <laughs> okay, so that's not. That's not. That's not. Put my name onto something that's not accurate here. <laughs> Oh, all right, okay, all right. Okay. you're out of time, right out of time. Don't make okay, fun okay. of me today. <laughs> you hurt my feelings today. I like the Kardashians. Gosh. <laughs> and your answer is? My answer is also... The Kardashians. No, it's pretty straightforward also. The Kardashians. No. Can you name, name me all the Kardashians? Go ahead. You know um, all of them, don't you? Kim, Courtney, I know Kendall Jenner, Kylie Jenner. And I don't remember the last sister. The I'm oh. sorry. And the father, you don't know. OJ's lawyer. Because that's the only one Caitlyn, I know. Caitlyn Jenner? No, what, I don't know. No, they get divorced. I think from the from the ah the the, 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 the yeah the father the biological Kim's, father. Ah, okay, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, my answer is yeah. the Bachelor. Actually, what is what is Google <laughs> with the Bachelor? So is that, just, wait, is that show okay, still on? Just imagine. Okay. I don't watch reality TV at all. <laughs> by the way, like the, my reality TV is the NFL. So the Bachelor is you know you have one Bachelor. I know you how have the show a lot works. Of women competent. competent yeah, this whole show him, is right? sick and disgusting. By the way, in my opinion. <laughs> Like, so, no, for real. Like, this guy's, like, sleeping around with all these women, and then he's, like, <laughs> he's, like, trying them all out. 
Like that's like what? Seriously? <laughs> that's can't a wave. No, I can't. I, I can't wrap my head around this. We're literally okay with a guy <laughs> with like thirty girls, and in reverse, right? Right? They have the bachelorette, right? Right? Like right. they're sleeping with all these people and saying, "Let me try you out and try you out," and blah 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 blah. Why would you want a guy like this? This guy's a scumbag. Well, he's probably rich or something. He's a scumbag. He's like yeah, sleeping around with tons of women. She's a, the same thing for the girl. I don't get the girl off the hook either. <laughs> So we got a ton of guys. It's like, yeah, it's a quality. Pro- I, I want this person. Let me compete for this one. What are you nuts? <laughs> Wait, besides the fact the guy's probably got syphilis. Oh my god. Okay, I'm sorry. You I mean, I didn't mean to rant. <laughs> okay. Let me so, answer. Yeah, why the I chose the why I chose it because Google so, got syphilis. Right. Just imagine mm-hmm. all the different domains competing over Google SERP. Like reality TV in its finest. I'm telling you. Right, Google right. is competing and sleeping around with all. It's Google sleeping with Bing and Google sleeping with Go. <laughs> Why Bing? No, the like the URLs are competing. Oh, the URLs are sleeping. Yeah, with I get it. Okay, URLs sleeping this with Google. Is, this show is ridiculous. <laughs> to be on top. This is ridiculous. And that'll do it for this week's episode of the In Search SEO podcast. Don't forget, it's in search because we're all in search for something of something. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Tune in next week.